Hello, everybody, and welcome back for Red Flags Part 2 of the IBS Freedom Podcast. I don't know why I made that, that noise. your flag? Yeah, that was my flag going up, and it was up. <laughs> That's your flag. I'll right. take it, you know, I'll take it. Amy is here with her flag, ready and rare to go. Uh, for those of you who maybe missed it last time, well, now you look like you're surrendering. Yeah, well. <laughs> Amy's waving her flag. <laughs> Hold on, I have a red pen. How about I wave the red pen? That'll okay, be my yes, red flag. There we go. Um, so if you missed it last time, we talked about red flags in the sense of what other people are saying to you or indicating to you or otherwise communicating with you. So these largely that episode fo- focused on things that your uh, your practitioner or your your like medical team, things that they might say to you or indicate to you that are kind of red flaggy and cringy or sus as the kids would say. Um, we also briefly mentioned at the end of the episode, like the people in your social circle, your spouse, your loved ones, your roommates, your friends, the people you hang out the most with, uh, cause there's a great deal of potential for that to throw you off in your healing journey. But now today we're going to talk about red flags in the sense of like internal, we're going deep. We're going deep for this one because it's like, if you catch yourself saying this, or thinking this, or doing this, hopefully after this episode, it will send up a little red flag in your brain of like, ooh, that's not helping me, or that's not normal, right? So with that being said, um, my beautiful, wonderful podcast co-host, Amy, do you want to maybe lead us off with a little something something? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, one of the biggest red flags to me is if you're if oh my dad just rode rode by on his bike sorry I got distracted um sometimes that happens in client calls and I'm like oh my dad just rode his bike by my window um but anyway back to our red flag episode um I think one of the big things is if you're trying a diet and you're not doing well on the diet, being able to kind of listen to that internal voice saying, you know, Mm. I've been keto for two months and I'm feeling bad. I think there Mm. can be a reaction sometimes. And I feel like I've been here too, where you think, well, maybe I'm just not doing keto enough or like I'm not Mm. doing it the right way. Or maybe I'm not, right. I'm not doing FODMAP like, I, oh, I totally forgot I didn't pull this out. I need to get more intense. Or maybe it's it's not just FODMAPs, but it's I need to pull out lectins or something. Like you, There's this sort of knee-jerk reaction to get more restrictive if something isn't working when it could yeah. be more that the diet that you're following just isn't a good fit or you're just not able to get the right nutrition for your particular body in the way you're eating. So I think th- that's a big, big, big one that I see a lot, almost not listening to your internal signaling or Mm. um, almost, uh, what's the word I'm looking, misinterpreting the actual Mm -hmm. outcome. So instead of it being like, oh, this diet just isn't a good fit for me, it's more that, oh, I need to double down and pull more stuff out or or do keto more intensely or do paleo more intensely and remove the rice that I was eating. Um, so I see that a lot and and I think that that's a really big one. I feel like this knee jerk reaction to go more extreme when maybe Mm -hmm. the, the restrictions that you were doing just weren't a good fit to begin with. Yeah. And I think that there's a few pieces to this too. I think a, I guess it's like, if you restrict and then you find yourself thinking I need to restrict more or like more strictly rather than questioning if restriction is the right thing for you, period. Right. Like that's maybe the first difference is like if something doesn't work, well, maybe it's just not for you. Right. Like maybe that diet doesn't work. Maybe restricting your diet period is not for you. Maybe it's not effective for what you have. Um, But to kind of dissect the psychology of this, I think I might have been a psychologist in another lifetime, but not this one. Um, You know, I think that there's a few things folded in here. We've got um, kind of like a call to authority, logical Mm, fallacy, where it's like, oh, my doctor 
prescribed right. this diet for me and therefore it must be right or it's an authority figure and I'm going to listen to them because mm-hmm. my doctor or dietitian or whoever told me to do this. Um, two, not trusting your body or not trusting yourself. Right. Like that, that gets folded into this journey for a lot of people where it's like you feel like your body has betrayed you or it's out to get you, or your gut hates you, your microbes hate you. It's like this war mentality of like you versus the microbes, you versus the SIBO, you versus the candida. So a lot of people get in this space where it's like, they don't feel like they can trust their body anymore, because it feels like them versus their body. I assure you that's not actually what's happening. But it feels that way. Right. Um, Right. So I think that's a piece of it. And then of course, we have to nod to just dogmatic black and white thinking Mm -hmm. and like marketing. Lord knows the internet is designed to make you see black and white. Yes, no, you're either with me or against me. You're either vegan or you're carnivore. There's no in between. And, you know, it's like, if you get into keto as an example, and you're watching all of Dr. Berg's videos and you're sipping the Kool-Aid that keto is the only diet for all human beings, no matter what is going on with them, then, you know, once you start sipping the Kool-Aid and going down that like borderline religious viewpoint of nutrition, it's really hard to pull yourself out. And even like, I've seen people too, where it's like their Instagram handle is like keto girl for life or whatever. And it's like, ooh, that person's never, ever going to change because they've like made this their identity now. And similarly, vegans are notorious for this too. Like you get, you get 10 vegans in a room and ask them, Hey, would you ever entertain eating any sort of animal protein ever again? And like 10 out of 10 of them will typically say no, no way in hell. So yeah, I I think that there's a few reasons why people can get stuck in this, this mentality again of like, I'm going to restrict. Oh, it didn't work. I'm going to, I'm going to be more hardcore or I'm going to be good. I'm going to be like an obedient patient or an obedient person and do this extra super good. Right. Um, Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, those are good, good call outs. And I think that, that the authority thing's really big, just sort of feeling like you can't trust yourself to make those judgment calls, even though your body's sending you the signals that this just isn't right, um, or a good fit for you. Um, yeah, I think, sorry to go ahead, cut you off for a second. But before I forget it, um, one thing that I thought of for this episode, too, is just the kind of general blanket of if you find yourself saying or thinking that a certain food is bad or good, or inflammatory, that I think is red flaggy, too. And again, it goes back to like, Oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes, it's the more dogmatic, borderline religious, like indoctrination to certain diets where like, okay, if you're like sipping the keto Kool-Aid, you're going to think carbs are the root of all evil. Right. And fat is like, ah, like right. said to us from the angels in the heavens above. Um, if you, you know, if you're doing Atkins or carnivore, you're going to think that protein is God's greatest gift to mankind and carbs are evil. If you're doing vegan, depending on what it is, like what variation of vegan, you might think that all fat is horrible and evil and inflammatory. You might think that all animal, usually you think that all animal products are just like intrinsically bad for you. And there's never a conversation of the gray area between, and there's never a conversation for context. Oh yeah. But if you look back at throughout time, the quote unquote good food and the evil foods change yeah like everybody's laughing right now and kind of being um a little bit cocky where it's like ha 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 i can't believe in the 80s and 90s we thought that fat was bad for us how crazy is that we were so silly ha 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 ha. we know better now and it's like well okay (laughs) are you gonna have the exact same reaction 20 years from now when you look back at the keto craze and the carnivore craze and you're like you know, you're laughing about something else, like, right. ha, 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 I can't believe we thought carbs were bad for us. Now we know protein is bad for us or some right. crap like that. Right. Like, it's just, it's it's the flavor of the week or it's the flavor of the decade, what food we demonize and which one we put up on a pedestal. So maybe, maybe we just shouldn't be doing that. Right. And I do think, again, 
the context is so important. You mentioned that, and I want to expand on that a little bit because if you're starving on the beach and you have no food, like obviously if a, if a big thing of candy bars came in, you'd be like, thank God for these candy bars because like now we can survive for the next 10 days yeah. till we get help. Or mm -hmm. I mean, that's an extreme example, but I, I also think again, like in the context of a nutrient dense diet, you should be able to have some treats as long as you do okay eating those treats. And I think when you have the black and white thinking where these this food's just total shit and junk and like has no value. I mean, eating ice cream makes me happy and I feel and okay doing it here or there. And so like mm -hmm. th that's that's important to me to be able to have some things that like ice cream or treats and maybe you're you're dairy intolerant you can't do ice cream but you have another treat that you find that works well for you my dark chocolate addiction right like so you know whatever floats your boat right but i think you know the idea that like having ice cream here or there is going to like just destroy your health um mm -hmm. is so insane and i also think that it's not playing into like your mental health at all. Like when you're that rigid, it creates yeah. mental health issues and you miss out on things. Like there is experiential totally. things that are really fun to be able to indulge in like ice cream, um, even like cultural stuff. Like I feel like sometimes people get so intense with like FODMAPs and they've taken out beans or like things that are just a part of their culture and they just are not eating their cultural foods. Like, I think that that is a, a big issue too. Yeah. Um, and again, you, you have to figure out like what, what that looks like for you in particular. But I think that, you know, there really, to me, is not like good or bad foods per se. I yeah. think it, it comes down to, yeah, you want to be eating some nutrient dense food, but even the foods that aren't nutrient dense still have some value and um, still have a place at the table. Um, yeah. So again, I, I think that that was a really good point. I feel that that's a lot of people get stuck in that mindset. Well, and if you think about it too, like I've joked about this for years, but I swear to God, it's true. I think eating occasional junk food and treats is genuinely good for your vagal tone. Right. And therefore, right? Because like that's, that's the part of your nervous system that is keyed into safety, uh, connectedness, like happiness, fulfillment, right. like all of these right. feel good oxytocin kind of um emotions and like if you get to go and have ice cream with your friends when you're out and about or if you get to have like a movie night at home and you have popcorn or if you you know i don't know like you get the idea but if you go to a wedding and you get to eat the the cake right, i almost said you right. go to a wedding and eat birthday cake um the wedding cake and you like celebrate the union of these people at the wedding like all of that, it all of that can help you feel connected to the people right. around you. It brings you enjoyment. It tastes delicious, and all of it is is priming your vagus nerve and telling you you're connected. You're safe. You are safe to digest this food. You're going to be okay. Let's digest this. Like we are resting and digesting right now, and we're connected and happy and fulfilled and safe. So honestly, I, I think that the more you restrict and the more like orthorexic you get, the more obsessed with healthy eating you get for any of these diets. Right. I think that you are disconnecting your vagus nerve and you're dampening your vagal tone. And then guess what? You're not going to make stomach acid. You're not going to have bile flow. You're not going to have digestive enzymes. Your gut's going to be leaky. Your liver is going to be inflamed. Your motility is going to stink. Right. Like that's where the trouble happens when your vagus nerve and your motility suffer. So yeah, it's, you know, but I will say this in this day and age, especially the problem is we have all of these like taboos and like nasty mm -hmm. things around food and like, you know, it kind of paints the picture and I'm going to be crass. Like this is not my viewpoint, but I'm just going to be crass. Cause I think this is how it's kind of held in, um, in a lot of, um, people's minds. There's this, this um 
Hold on, Amy's stripping for us now. I want her to hear this. Sorry, I'm stripping. I know, I just said that. I was like, Amy's stripping for us, but I want you to hear this. So, uh, because I'm talking to you, not the people. Sorry, yes. No, I'm I'm kidding. I'm talking to all of you. But um, the point is, there's all of this like yucky stuff and like cultural and societal and like garbagey stuff around the idea of food being pleasurable and right. bringing you happiness because right. it kind of starts painting the picture of like the fat slob on the couch binge eating a bag of Doritos and binge eating a big tub of of Briar's ice cream right and like just clicking through the the channels and it paints this picture of like the fat slob who can't control themselves and they just eat their emotions and you know food brings them happiness and it's that's so icky right and awful and like not true for so many of us, but like, I think that there's a difference between drowning your emotions in junk food versus like that picture that's painted versus like living your life. And like, if you're on vacation, get the ice cream. Or if you're at the wedding, like have a piece of cake if you're able to, or, you know, have some chocolate or have like a cookie every now and then. This we're recording this not that long after Halloween. Like I've eaten some of my daughter's Halloween candy and right. it's freaking delicious and I love it so much. And like I'm not beating myself up having like a little nibble of a Charleston chew. Like so sue me. Right. Well, I'm and fine. it gets funny too, just because I I you know just being kind of in the wellness space. You have every year people sharing videos about how shitty Halloween candy is and like we're poisoning yep. our children and. I'm giving out beef jerky sticks. And it's like, well, I'm not going to come to your house for trigger treating. <laughs> like, I'm sorry. Like, yeah. I don't want your beef. I, me as a five-year-old or six-year-old trigger treating, I don't want your beef collagen me stick as or an something. Adult. Right. Like, I don't want that. Right. It's just like, again, like, even if your you want to... Your house is going to get acted. Right. Even if you want to be a little bit healthy, like, you can find some candy that might be a little bit better, but it's like... Yeah come on like it just is such an eye roll moment but I think you're right like I think that some people feel even when they're indulging in like a reasonable amount they feel the shame of like Mm -hmm. the picture you're painting of oh I'm like not paying attention to my health and I'm you know I don't care about my health I'm no better than the person who goes to McDonald's every day right so I think that if you if there's a level of that shame that you're feeling that's red flaggy from like just indulging say that too yeah indulging in some of the treats that you know we all should hopefully be able to indulge in um unless there's again like a, a big reason not to medically or for some other reason but most of us yeah 99.9% of us should be able to find some middle ground there yeah well and even like you know if you are in the middle of an honest to goodness candida treatment protocol. Mm-hmm. Yes, maybe don't have the Halloween candy. Right. Like maybe get lilies or hashtag not sponsored. Right. Like maybe get something that's that's less sugar and is arguably a bit healthier for you. But like and again and like if you're undergoing like cancer treatment and your cancer type is one that's very sensitive to glucose levels. Like, yeah, maybe don't do it right now. But I think for the vast majority of people listening to this podcast, like 99.9%, I think a little bit of a treat here or there would tone your vagus nerve and be a really good thing for you. Right. Um, And, you know, it's funny, you brought up this, this, um, you brought up a a memory from the archives from a few years ago. Mm. Um. I remember I worked with this woman. I don't remember what she had going on exactly. um, But I remember she found me on YouTube. And she said she had been working with a health coach on, I think it was SIBO, oddly enough. Like she was working with a health coach on SIBO for a while. And she was kind of explaining the protocol. And it was like a very strict diet And one of the things that the health coach hammered the snot out of was no sugar, no sugar, no sugar. Mm -hmm. And um, she hadn't had great results one way or another. Like she was very like depleted and and wasn't really eating a lot. But I remember this one story that she was saying, she said, yeah, um, 
I was working with this health coach still around Halloween, and I mentioned my son, who I think was like 10 or 12. I mentioned my son going trick-or-treating and getting ready for Halloween, and the health coach was like, wait, what? You, you're you going to have Halloween candy in your house? And the patient was like, oh, well, yeah, yeah, for him. And like, you know, we, we help moderate, so he only gets like a piece or two a day or whatever. But she was like, don't worry, I'm not going to eat the Halloween candy. Like, I'm, I'm being super diligent on my diet. I'm being super good, so don't worry. That freaking health coach shamed the shit out mm-hmm. of my patient. This was before she was my patient. Sorry. Shamed the crap out of this woman and acted like you would have thought she had... I don't even know, like just heroin needles laying around right. everywhere in her house right. for uh, God in the world to see. You would have thought it was something horrible right. for you. Right. And she like shamed her and said, like, I don't care if you're going to eat it or not. You should not have any sugar in your house at all. It is toxic. It is poisonous. It's horrible for you. You're going to you're gonna get sicker. I can't believe you would do that. No, 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 no. And I was just listening to this story when I first met this woman, like, oh my God, I don't even know where to go from here. This is nuts. Right. Like, I'm sorry, You, no matter what you're doing, even if, again, if you are like stage four cancer and you cannot have sugar, I think you could still have sugar in your house. Like, again, if your spouse or your kid or your family has it, or if you use it very occasionally in your cooking or baking, like, I don't... I really don't think it's so evil that you need to get rid of anything completely from your house with the exception of uh, anaphylactic food allergies and maybe celiac disease. Right. Like you do have to be careful with cross-contamination with those situations, but like sugar or like animal protein, like, oh, I can't believe you have a piece of chicken in the fridge. (laughs) And you're a vegan. It's like big whoop de doo. It's right. it's fine. But again, it's like right. these kind of things are trigger are like red flaggy for disordered eating and dogmatic thinking right. and like dogmatic Ooh, bullshit. Look at that red and... flag waving. I know. I'm well, waving as much as I can. Well, and I think too, like it's it always is interesting. And I'm sure you've had these experiences where like you're reviewing dietary data from a client and they're like, oh, I was really bad this day. And it's like, you look at their data and it's like, no, like you were fine. You had like one little treat. Everything else looks good. And like, I I feel like there's like a harsh level of judgment and probably because they work with providers that were like similar to the one or again, like they're just more intense and stumbling on stuff themselves online where again sugar stocks yeah. and i i love like the the um i feel like it's like this whole gets me. right i feel like it's the whole like insulin theory of like diabetes has like exploded to which again like there's a lot of really great researchers that combat that um like chris master john has done a whole, a whole bunch of podcasts on mm. like sugar not being like really it's calorie excess that's the problem more so than sugar um and Stephen guillaume has done some stuff on that too but again you have people who are in that realm that that talk like you know sugar is addictive as cocaine and like again they they put it in the drug category and it's just yeah. insane it's like you cannot equate sugar the, the minute you equate sugar with a drug i'm just not going to listen to you because yeah you lose credibility right it's absurd it, it's honestly absurd um yeah again i think i feel like almost this belonged in the other episode but i'll mention it i feel like if you hear the word toxic right like that's almost <laughs> that's a half a red flag right i i do think um you know, supporting detoxification can be helpful. I'm not one of those people who's like, as long as you have a liver, you're detoxing every day. Nah. Like, right, right. There, are, there are strategies and there are protocols. And like, we are surrounded by garbage in our environment and like pollution and bisphenol A and just garbagey compounds. So it's not to say that supporting detoxification isn't without merit. But I feel like A lot of people, especially on social media, bring up the idea of toxins and detox. And it's like, I don't know. It's a very good way to motivate people 
Because it's like, oh, you're like dirty. You need a detox. You need a cleanse. Here's my cleanse. And they're usually just trying to sell their product. Right. Or encourage you to like follow all their posts and stuff. And I don't know. I just think that the word detox and the word toxin is a little bit red flaggy. The word toxicant might be uh, better a lot of the times where it's like, okay, bisphenol A isn't going to kill you immediately, but it is doing some weird stuff to your right, body. Right, right. And it's borderline toxic. Or like... Right, the accumulation um, of it is more the toxic aspect of it versus like... Well, like, or like, to what extent do you need to be avoiding it? Because again, like... Yeah. There's things that you can do for some of... To try to reduce exposures to things in the environment that make sense and aren't going to like deter your life, but you can definitely yeah. take it to the extreme. And I feel like what you're describing with people online or practitioners, they can take it to the extreme where you're freaked out to about everything, and you yeah. spend way too much time and energy on that one thing when you might benefit greatly from other strategies. And you just touched on something or you got close to it accidentally another red flag if you ever think that you are going to do an overhaul and you're going to rapidly crazily change everything (laughs) so like i'll paint you some examples um sometimes i bring up the idea of toxic chemical garbage in our world and i i talk about this like we're that's module 11 in FODMAP Freedom. Sometimes I bring it up with patients where I'm like, hey, I think that it sounds like you could benefit from, you know, working on this or like, this is kind of where we're at. And sometimes people are like super freaked out by that idea. And they're like, oh my God. So do I need to, do I need to throw away everything and just start anew? And like, they're almost ready to go like get everything off of the shelf in the shower and like all their soaps, all their perfume, all their whatever, all their lipstick, like they're literally going to (laughs) go clean house on their entire house, throw everything in the garbage and then go run out to whole paycheck and buy $5,000 worth of cosmetics and lotions and potions and perfumes and bug repellents and sunscreens and everything. And I'm, I'm not saying it's a bad idea to like swap out for cleaner products but that idea of like, oh, I've got to do it all right now, that's red flaggy to me too. And I see it also with nutrition. And I, I get the appeal of this. I get where this could be helpful sometimes. But like the idea of doing, like going from your normal diet to a cleanse or a thing or a whole 30, where it's like Tuesday, I eat whatever. And then Wednesday, I'm super strict. Right. Or like, I don't know if you know many of these people, but sometimes you'll see like nutritionists or nutrition professionals or health coaches who like drive to your house Mm -hmm. and they'll do a pantry overhaul and they'll hoe out all the stuff they think is bad and like throw it in a garbage bag in front of you. And then maybe (laughs) they'll take you on like a grocery shopping trip or they'll give you recommendations for replacements. But the point is they're going into your cupboards and throwing away everything and making you start anew. Mm Mm-hmm. Part of me sees the appeal of that. And then part of me is like, yeah, that's not going to be sustainable. When you go from zero to 100 like that, it's it's like we talk about the pendulum sometimes. Like, right. okay, if you're holding the pendulum way up here to this side, eventually, someday, one day, the pendulum is going to release and the pendulum is going to swing over to the other side right. versus if you could make gradual changes. Right. Well, and I I feel like it almost boils down to the level of urgency that you're experiencing. Like, Mm -hmm. I feel like some people that I work with, like the degree of urgency or wanting to make the most change, the quick, like make the quickest change because they're trying to get to the finish line so much quicker. So like they think if they can just like overhaul their pantry or overhaul their products or whatever, that and it's there's this like frantic nature about it like it's almost like urgent i I don't even know how to necessarily that's how i kind of describe it yeah desperate like a desperate quality to it if you feel like at any point in your journey that you're kind of operating in a very urgent frantic desperate manner and nothing feels 
calm, kind of cool and collected. And I feel like, I feel right. I feel like it, it, the urgency almost boils down to again, like wanting to get to the finish line faster. Yeah. And that is definitely a red flag too. Like if you are just so focused on the finish line, um, which again, we all want to get better if we have issues going on. So no one's, no one's arguing with that, but I, I tend to work with people and it's like, I've put my whole life on hold for this and I need Mm. to get to the finish line as quick as possible. So then I can start living again. And it's like, those cases don't typically turn out well, unless we can kind of reincorporate them back into their lives at some to some degree maybe it's again not to the degree of which they were prior maybe they're they're you know able to do some of the things but not all because their health kind of prevents them somewhat but like Mm. i feel like this urgency lack of like if you're finding that there's no patience or your timeline is not like that you're expecting to get better is not a reasonable period of time because if you've had ibs for 10 years and you're thinking you know i if i just do this whole 30 everything will be fine in a month and i feel like i've been in this mentality before like during my very early on in my gut journey i was definitely stuck in this mentality like i just have to like have my diet set perfect i have to like not drink and like go out with my friends for a month and then I have to but yeah by by next month I'll be like good to go and it's I think you can set yourself up for problems if you do that and it's not to say you don't ever assess progress or move towards the finish line but I find if you're so obsessed with the finish line but not the process Mm -hmm. not doing the steps that will get you there in a and again in a reasonable way like again if the steps to get you there are taking you completely out of your life you're consumed by the process that's not good either but if you are doing things in a reasonable manner and working in kind of different areas um to get to the finish line and you're being patient with it and understand hey like this could take some time i'm not going to put pressure on Mm -hmm. being better by a certain date um yeah. But I'm just going to kind of try to move the n- needle, work um, work from a place of getting more information and experimenting. And again, eventually I'll get there, but I'm not putting pressure on like this timeline. Um, yeah. I think that that can be really, really helpful. But I do find that a lot of people get really hung up on like, I have to be better by this date. And I'm going to like... Yeah be super intense about it until I get to that point. And it's like, uh, like I, or I don't, I'm going to be deeply unsatisfied right. if I don't get better by the magical date. Right. Right. Like that's, that's, you're setting yourself up for disappointment potentially. Right. And I don't, I, I think you were going to continue and I interrupted you. Oh no. Or, again, like I, I just think, you know, it, I feel like there's a couple different aspects of what I was saying, but the finish line thing, again, try not to put a date on things. But I think again, if the process involves taking you completely out of your life, and it's all consuming, that's red flaggy too. So if you feel like again, you're not able to engage, or again, your your mentality is, oh, I'll do that once I'm better. Or like, I can't Mm. do that now I have to push that off because like, I'm not going to go on my vacation because like, I just couldn't eat the food or whatever. Like You're pushing off a lot of stuff. Um, again, typically that doesn't work out super well either. Um, yeah, well, it kind of, it, I'll share something from a world that I don't have a lot of experience with. Um, it's kind of the, the quintessential story of weight loss. I need to lose 20 pounds by my sister's wedding on the 12th. Or I need to lose X amount of pounds before summer. Right. I need to lose X amount of pounds before this trip or before I speak on stage or before I do whatever. And I'm not saying that goals are bad. Right. And I get, I know like the, what is it? Specific, measurable, like I know all of the smart goal stuff. It's not to say goals are bad, but you really need to assess, are they 
are they reasonable? Right. Well, that's a part right? of the like, smart goal. I feel like they have to be yes, it is be reasonable, and I think that that's probably the biggest issue that most people have is their goals aren't yeah. reasonable. My husband is like, I have to lose ten pounds in the next week because we're going to a wedding. I'm like. It's not good going luck. right now. I'm like, okay, mm, good luck with that. And, and he says to the dietitian wife. I know. He's like, honest to God, my biggest project. And I just don't have time. <laughs> I don't have time to deal with it. So I'm just like, it's just kind of an eye roll and move on half the time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh my gosh. But again, he's these, a really these... great example of the frantic energy though, because I feel like yes. he's the type that'll go like all in on workouts. He'll be like working out six days a week for like two weeks and then we'll go the like three weeks with nothing and then it's he's like yeah oh, i gotta get back on the train again and it's like oh, lord you're Which killing goes back me. to my point right like right. if you do the overhaul and you're holding the pendulum up here you're not going to be able to hold it that way forever right. it makes so much more sense to gradually move you in the right direction and make gradual changes that feel sustainable and you don't feel like you're missing out on life. You don't right. feel like it's a huge burden. It's not drudgery. Well, like I've kind of done that with exercise to some degree mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. And like, it's never been sustainable. But when I kind of change to, oh, I'll work out when I feel like it. And I'm going to switch over to things that I find enjoyable. And like not stress about going to the gym or right. Orange Theory or whatever it is. Like, I don't know. For me, that was really beneficial because the all or nothing mentality for exercise meant that for the last decade, I mostly just didn't exercise. Yeah. A aside from like these little spurts, like what you described with Armand. Yeah. Well, and I, I think that you're dead on with kind of taking what's like the baby step that to take. And I, I find too, that if you're taking these wild leaps, usually you can't focus on multiple things at one time either. So, which is a, a big aspect of gut healing. Like if you're just focusing on diet and that's where you're putting a hundred percent of your energy, you can't focus on stress or living your life or movement. So it, I think you're much better off too being able to take baby steps in a lot of different areas versus getting hyper focused on one and super extreme on one one area mm -hmm. what i've generally seen is way more helpful in in getting you to the actual finish line is taking baby steps in a variety of different areas that might be lacking or needing some work um so yeah i wanted to point that out to you so how are you diversifying your investments in your journey yeah again that's a good way to put it yeah it's hard it's gonna be way hard to do it and way harder to get where you want to be if you're just putting all your eggs in one basket and not able to, yeah. to put eggs in other baskets. Um, well, to go back to something too, going back to what we talked about with like sugar, right? right? Um, I think that even sugar could be health promoting in certain contexts in moderation because it's enjoyable and it's connecting you and it can prime your vagus nerve and be good for vagal tone. If you think about like this all or nothing, like I'm on a diet right. kind of mentality, what do you think the outcome will be for your vagus nerve? Right. Is that going to make you feel like safe and connected and like kumbaya? Or right. is it going to make you feel like my life was broken. My body was broken. I'm going to fix it. This is right. it that, you know, I was a slob before, but now I'm a worker outer or whatever it might be, or like, you know, ripping off the band aid, or even just like forcing yourself to do something that is drudgery or it sucks. Right. Like that's not good for your vagus nerve. And that's kind of where I got with exercise. Again, I was like, I could theoretically force myself to go to the gym, right. but I hate it. Like, I don't right. like it. It's drudgery. It's, I feel like I'm forcing myself to go. And like, I don't think that's good for me on some level. Right. Versus I look forward to doing my dorky fitness martial exercises. And I look forward to like throwing around a little bit of weight in the basement. Right. So yeah, I just, I think that like the vagal connection with all of this is worth mentioning, but a lot of people in this world think that they have to like push through and suffer and rip off the band aid right. in various ways. Like, Oh, I have to just push through the die off and feel shitty before I feel better. 
or, oh, I just have to deal with the terrible elemental diet for two, three weeks, and then I'm everything's going to be roses and rainbows after the elemental diet. Right. Well, it's, it almost and, reminds me, too, of, like, the mentality of, like, you have to give 110% or else you won't get better in every area. And It's, it's not l- possible. Right. It, it's not possible, and... Again, I, I just think you have to work smarter, not harder. And and I think mm-hmm. that that goes for a lot of areas of, of living in general. Um, but it almost like, it almost breeds a little bit of like grind culture somewhat with like some mm-hmm. of these diets. It's like, oh, I just have to do everything super precise and mm-hmm. I have to- Suck it up. Yeah, suck it up and like just do it. And it's like, mm no maybe you don't have to just do it like nike yeah says. it again there's there's probably some gray area right so like posing this example um we ha- I, we have a family friend and they have some kids and the one kid i don't know if he's ever eaten a vegetable right right like, I just, I'm, I'm trying to picture a time I saw the kid eat a vegetable. I can't imagine it. Um, I think I saw him eat apple slices once. But, so I guess, you know, I could count fruit. But really, it's just like frozen waffles and sugary yogurt and like cookies and goldfish crackers. And it's not a good situation nutritionally. Theoretically, just using that as an example, if this kid gets to be older and he spends, you know, 16, 18, 20, 30, 42, I don't know. If if that kid lives a chunk of his life eating that way, and that's all he's ever known, just eating junk. Right. And then if he's like, oh, I want to get healthy, I want to lose weight, I want to do this. That's a situation where I think that the pantry overhaul makes a lot of sense. I think that that's a situation where it's like, yeah, you might have to just kind of rip off the Band-Aid and push through it because right. you're like rebooting your entire brain right. and your entire body at this point. And it might get weird and like your gut might might be upset initially because of all the fiber that you've literally never seen before. And, you know, your poops are going to be weird for a while. But I think if you push through a couple of months of adjustment period, it will be good. And, you know, if you're motivated like you could get through it. So I do think there are situations out there where, you know, somebody's coming from a genuinely really unhealthy, like standard American background and they want to eat clean and they want to get fit and they want to like feel better. So there is a little bit of this where like, yeah, it, it, it could be that it takes you a while to develop a taste for these things or like, right. You know, hippy dippy people say like, once you cut out sugar, you'll realize that fruit is really sweet. And like, you don't need candy because fruit is incredibly sweet. And while I don't think it means we have to cut out candy and junk food entirely, I will say, like, in this phase of my life, in the last 10 years or whatever, um, I eat so little genuine junk food that yeah, when I eat fruit, it tastes really sweet to me. Right. And if I do eat ice cream or a treat, it is really sweet to me. And that also helps me moderate so I don't eat as much of it. Right. Um, But anyway, I guess I just want to share, like, nothing is black and white. Right, right. And if you think something is black and white, that is probably a red flag in and of itself. (laughs) But um, I I think that... I need to get, like, something red. I know, you need to... I have have so many things I could make red flags. I've got a pink highlighter i've got this little like what i got like what i found sack thing red. here this is my new my new red flag <laughs> that actually does like my little my little super around. asian pouch Aww. thing that's like shredded to bits i love my super asian pouch um um i have a i have another one too do you, do you all right. hit us let us have it um so This we've covered a lot, but if you find yourself spending hours researching, just don't. Um, That's a that's a for sure red flag. Just don't. Yes. Um, I again like some some research is okay. I I think, um, but trying to figure out what that what that healthy balance is for you 
honestly, mm-hmm. potentially, if you are an over researcher, putting limits on yourself. So, like maybe it's like mm-hmm. an hour to a week or something, or yeah. uh, you know, this podcast you can view as a little bit of research or something. But mm-hmm. yeah, I I find sometimes I'll talk to clients and it's in you know the level of research that they're doing is it well it does a couple things i mean firstly it's going to pull you from your life if you're researching all the time yeah. and again there can feel like there's this urgency behind it like i have to figure this out yeah. and then i think there's a second piece of it that's problematic and that's that it oftentimes creates a lot of doubt if you're seeing something that's contradictory to like what Mm -hmm. I've suggested or another practitioner has suggested. Um, And again, there's no one size fits all for this stuff. So there's going to be contradictory information and you could just be confusing yourself even more with researching. Mm -hmm. So those are the two, those are the two biggie, big problems I see with it. I agree wholeheartedly. And I want to just say before I add two other dimensions to it, um, research is not done. Right. And right. it never will be. Right. We humans know a lot of stuff. There's also right. a crap load that we do not know. Mm-hmm. And there, for for the rest of human existence, I think, I hope, we will have researchers and scientists and doctors <laughs> conducting research and trying to learn more about our world. So, you know, it's it sometimes even you can read research and it it feels so absolute. It feels so black and white. Right. Like, ah, this study said this. And I can I all right, you can stay if you're quiet. All right, my daughter's gonna join Ooh. us apparently. Super quiet. She's crouching behind me. <laughs> um but anyway, you know, it's like research isn't done. So this idea that you can like go to PubMed and find the answer. Well, I don't know. Right. Like, you might read one study and then another research group tries to replicate the study in five years and they do not find the same <laughs> the same findings. And then we need to do further studies to see if we can verify it or, or cancel it out. And it's like a single study very rarely tells you much of anything. It could give you hints and it can lead you down a certain path, but it's very rarely going to give you all the answers. Right. And this like search for the Holy Grail in whether it be Facebook groups or PubMed or podcasts like this one or YouTube videos like mine, like it, the search is exhausting and it's draining and it's pulling you from your life. And you're right. Like you need to kind of set a timer on it. I will also say to go back to something you said, it creates doubt. Right. I feel like this is more of an issue in people who have some health OCD as part of their presentation. Mm -hmm. Cause again, it's like, they're they're doubting they're fearful and it's like it's it's like that cycle that we talked about and every time you go back to the research or the facebook groups or pubmed you're like you're scratching the itch and it feels better in the moment like ah i did a good thing right but it's also feeding that kind of ocd-ish cycle in you so that's not good right Um, like it it starts with this idea of like oh i'm not going to get better unless i figure this out on my own and then mm -hmm. you research for hours and you're like oh i think i found like another option or another supplement or another this Mm -hmm. or that that i think would help and like i have another avenue the avenue's clear now and it's and (sighs) and then you inevitably get disappointed and then you spiral and then you go back on pubmed and right it also i think it feeds into the idea of trust like if you're pouring over papers on pubmed and facebook groups and SIBO summits like you're you're engaging your left brain your analytical brain so much Mm -hmm. that the rest of your nervous system doesn't have the ability to really communicate with you and if you're on pubmed for like three hours every night researching stuff a you're not going to be listening to your body like that's just that's a guarantee. You're not going to be reading a paper or reading a Facebook post and listening to your body simultaneously. But also it kind of feeds into that idea of like I can trust no one. Right. I can't trust my practitioner, I can't trust my my dietitian, I can't trust the internet, I can't trust people, I can't trust my body. I have to just find my own answers. Right. I'm the only one I can rely on. Right. It's a slippery slope. Yeah. Um yeah. 
Well, and, and I feel like too, um, with that, yeah, I, I think you're dead on. There's needing a level of certainty that you'll never get. Yeah. And again, no one can be 100% certain that, that your research is going to lead you to the thing that's going to help. Um, yeah. And so again, like there's a balance there and there's gray areas, but I think, you know, if you're just, if, if it seems, I think a good way to think about this, and this is something like with my own therapist that I have to, like, if we're trying to figure out if something's a compulsion, because they can be sneaky. Like if something Mm. is a compulsion, if you feel better after you do it, or you go like for a sense of relief, or again, like, I feel like it's almost like, if there's a level of urgency and then you get relief after you do it. Mm. Um, so research was a big one for me that I did a ton of during my own journey. And yeah. I feel like, again, there was like a sense of like, Ooh, I got to figure this out. Like it's so urgent. I am like uncomfortable sitting here doing yeah. nothing. I need to figure this out right now. So there's a level mm-hmm. of urgency and then like, Oh, I think I found another Avenue. Like, Oh, I feel like there's hope. And it's like, okay, yeah. I can go down this Avenue. And it's like, yeah, I think that there can be a little bit of that that can happen. But if you're just constantly spiraling like that, it's not going to help your journey at all. Yeah. Well, and to to kind of stay with this idea of the health OCD again, um, and going back to like, if you are assigning a date or a deadline to right. when you, you have to be better. Right. Um, particularly if it's like real quick. <laughs> Like, if you say, I want to lose 20 pounds this year, that's reasonable. Right. If you say, I want to lose 20 pounds this month, I'm sorry, that is not reasonable. And it's not sustainable, even if you do lose it. Similarly, if you've had IBS for five or 10 years, and you're like, oh, I should, you know, if I just take this magic supplement, I'll feel better in a month. I'm sorry, but that's that's just not realistic for the vast majority of you. Um. Sorry, I think I had a brain fart. I was I was going to tie these two together well, somehow. So you go ahead, because well, I have to marinate yeah, on that thought I, again, I think. I was going to say, too, like, even if you're someone that just is, like, almost too much of a perfectionist, like, I know that sounds weird, because, like, mm. I want to work with people that are going to work hard and, like, you know, do the things that I suggest. But if I'm seeing people yeah. that are, like super intense about hitting things 100% of the time to me that's a little bit of a red flag of like oh we need to like say that there can be some flexibility in here that we're looking for progress and not perfection um and I think again that can also tie into like an OCD-ish slant um yeah or and again like there's so much overlap between perfectionism and OCD um and I Mm -hmm. think being able to kind of let go a little bit and say, you know, if I'm doing things 80 or 90% of the time, then I'm doing a, a bang up job. Um, yeah. I don't need to be hitting things 100% of the time. I think the, the words good enough right. are the antidote for a lot of what we're describing right, right now. Right. Like if you can get to a point where, or even just the word enough, like I've said many times and I'll keep saying it until the cows come home we will never know everything. Right. The question is, will we know enough to help you feel better? Right. And usually the answer is yes, but we're never going to know everything about your body. Right. Pardon me. We're never going to know everything about the microbiome, about human health, about estrogen, whatever the topic is, we're never going to know everything, but that's okay as long as we know enough to help you and you can be okay with that idea of like not knowing all the things, but knowing enough of the things, um, two, two thoughts. And I hope I don't lose one of them in the process here. One to go back to the OCD and the desperation thing. Um, and like the idea of exposure therapy. Mm -hmm. Um, again, if you're finding that you have that like desperate, I have to feel better tomorrow kind of energy about you, A, it's completely understandable. You have felt like crap for a long time and you just, you want to feel better like yesterday. I get that. Um, But in a way, like an exposure therapy could almost be like sitting with, okay, what if, what if I feel exactly like this for the rest of my life? Right. 
And that sucks right. to think about. And nobody wants to think about that. But also just kind of like noodling on that a little bit could be part of the therapy for this red flag that we're describing of like that desperation and that like clamoring for anything and like clawing at everything. Right. And and just to just to jump in slightly, like the those types of thoughts, like if if thoughts like I'm never going to get better, um, you know, thoughts like that are coming up a lot. That's an intrusive thought. Um, so again, mm-hmm. like just being able to label that as like, okay, you know, I really like what you're saying. I really can't ever with 100% certainty say that I'm going to get better. Um, I'm going to take a chance and bet that I will. But like, again, I, I have to sit in the uncertainty that maybe I will never get better. But I do think just being able to label some of these thoughts that are coming up that are intrusive. So usually, again, they're automatic. It's not like you're sitting there wanting to like have these thoughts that you'll never get better. And there's like a deep yeah. core fear there. Um, that could be really scary, but I think, you know, being able to label them as like, okay, this thought, like, um, it isn't helpful. Um, Mm -hmm. and it's doesn't necessarily, it's not pushing me, pushing the needle at all. It's intrusive. It's not necessarily the reality per se. Um, but being able to kind of pinpoint when you're having intrusive thoughts that could be about Mm -hmm. foods too like oh i'm never gonna be able to add foods in like i'm just always going to be able to or what if this food causes bloating right exactly i'm not wearing my stretchy pants exactly and then again like the question is like well what if i do get bloated like maybe i will maybe i won't happen i can never really totally understand what foods my body will do well with at different times you know maybe even us like our guts are doing pretty good right and Every now and then, the shit hits the fan in weird ways. Like, right? I told I, it, I, I don't want to get into all the details, but I Marco Poloed <laughs> Nikki recently about the, an incident I had uh, coming yeah. home from a party um, that was again very random, not my typical, like wasn't even really my yeah. presentation in the past, but it was just kind of a weird episode, and it's like, yeah, just is what it is. Yeah, it was a blip. Right. Um, but again, I like say, I could my health OCD brain, I'm, I feel like, again, like could have clicked on and been like, Oh no, or my gut issues yeah. back. Like, do yeah. I have to be concerned that didn't happen? But like, you know, yeah. at, at maybe a different point in time, it certainly could have where like, yeah. I'm like, Oh my God, do I need to like do a regimen or something? Cause I had this incident a kill phase. Right. Well, it's so good that you brought that up because I I've seen that where like, somebody's feeling better. I and just recently I had one of these. Somebody's doing better. Maybe mm-hmm. they're not 100%, but they're doing a lot better. And then something happens. Sometimes they understand it and sometimes they don't. But like you're doing better, you're doing better, you're doing better and then you backslide. Right. Ooh, pardon me. Um you backslide. And again it's like when you have that hiccup, when you backslide a little bit, does your brain automatically go to Oh my God, I'm back to square one. I'm doomed. Right. I have to start another kill phase. Oh my God, I have to research again. Do you spiral? Right. Or are you just like, huh, okay, that's not ideal. Like, let's observe and see where this goes. And I might need to reach out to Amy or Nikki or my practitioner or whoever. Like, is is it more of like a huh, curiosity kind of a thing? And like, let's give it a little bit of time and see if it settles down. Or it does it send you into this catastrophe like, oh my God, my SIBO is back. I need to right. get on antimicrobials. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Or like, I messed up somehow. I I screwed up my body somehow. And it's like, no, just it's, I, I remember in episode one, I shared about going to Buffalo and visiting family and eating more junk food than I normally do and a lot more gluten-free bread. Um. Like I wasn't, I was still eating vegetables and fruit. I wasn't eating really poorly, but I was definitely relying on gluten-free bread more than I normally do for my calories. And like, I'll tell you what, like I was constipated again and like the, just the poops were not good Mm. for not only the couple weeks that I was in Buffalo, but also for like 
three weeks after I got home. Yeah. It took a while right. for my microbiome and my gut to kind of even out and reacclimate to my home, my life, my diet. And even like that idea, a friend has been traveling around and she panicked because she she's eaten a bunch of garbage visiting family in Illinois. Right. And, you know, has had some gut stuff. And then they ate a bunch of candy for Halloween. But then she was like, I'm going to be good. And she ate a giant, giant, like, kale salad. And then she said that she saw a lot of fibers in her stool, and her stool is really mucousy. And she was like, oh, my God, the SIBO is back. What do I do? And I was like, no, dude, you need to calm down, and you need to give your body time. You went from, like, no fiber to a bucket of fiber and roughage overnight your body just doesn't know how to process it right now. Just give it some time when you get back home and you get back on your normal diet, give it a couple of weeks. I guarantee you like the problem will subside, but she wigged out thinking like, you know, I Googled it and mucus in stool means that my intestines are inflamed. And I'm like, no, it means that you've been in Illinois eating like pizza and Halloween candy for the last two months right. and you're fine. You just need to get back to your normal. So um, anyway, that, I, I think that that was valuable because a lot of people in this world have that kind of knee jerk reaction of like a little bit, little bit of a backslide or maybe a big backslide. And then they automatically catastrophize to, Oh my God, I've, I've gone back to square one. And I've had patients literally ask me like, am I back to square one? I'm like, no, right. you're not. <laughs> right. Well, I feel like it's the, uh, it kind of boils down to the idea that you think the, the process is going to be 100% linear and well and black and white right you're either right you're either sick or you're perfectly healthy right right exactly and and um yeah it's always funny because i i feel like i have clients where like they start feeling really good and like pushing the boundary and like that boundary Mm -hmm. push creates some symptoms and they're like whoa and i'm like okay let's take a step back here like you're eating way more foods and like you having a little bit of a blip and you had yeah. like a great weekend with friends, but you drank too much and you ate yeah. kind of weird stuff is a totally normal thing. And, and I think it's important to, to like just step back and see how you're trending versus having like one or two mm. data points from a weekend or something and panicking. Yeah. So the yeah. more that, you, again, if you feel like you do that a lot where there's a sense of panic, um, it, it's something to explore. But I think if you can, pull back a bit and say, you know, I was just eating a little bit differently and this isn't necessarily a trend yet. This is a couple data points. It's understandable that my body's taken a a minute to process this. Right. And, and again, I, I think that that's, that's a big thing. And I, and I think it almost, um, goes with another, um, thing to be careful of from a mental standpoint is, when you are going outside your comfort zone, like you will have some symptoms usually, or there can be some adaptations um, that happen. And that's not necessarily a reason to pull back either. So Mm -hmm. again, like that can be a little gray too, because you have to talk to your provider as to like, what's a normal adaptation versus like a a reaction that's that's not, that's problematic. So, yeah, again, like that's something to think about too. Like if you're never pushing yourself outside of the comfort zone with things, mm-hmm. um, be out of fears of any reaction, that's probably a red flag as well from from my end. Yeah. I'll, I'll throw that flag. Well, and yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Because again, I think we talked about this in like the food reintroduction episode and right. probably other episodes. It's like you, I think it's normal or even expected right. that you'll have a little blip or a little change in symptomology when you introduce a new food or when you introduce a new supplement or whatever it might be. And you know, the you can almost imagine it like if you've never worked out in your life <laughs> and then all of a sudden I ask you to drop and give me 20. Right. Like you would understand why you were sore the following day, right? Right. Your body is not used to that. So you would have understanding and empathy for your body. You wouldn't be like, 
damn, my weekly arms. I can't believe my arms hurt today. I must be broken somehow. You would just be like, oh, well, of course my arms hurt. I've never worked out and I just did 20 push-ups. This makes total sense. So similarly, it's like, if your gut hasn't seen fiber in two years, right? or if it hasn't seen a FODMAP or a carbohydrate in two years, and then all of a sudden you're eating you know, a sweet potato or a banana or some beans. I don't know. Like, is it really surprising that it, you have a little bit of gas or a little bit of bloating or your stool changes a bit? I don't think that's surprising. Right. Like, again, it's, it's like my friend, like she went from eating garbage to at her words, not mine for the note. She went from eating garbage to eating a giant kale salad. Like, is it really surprising that you didn't have the digestive gusto to like break down all that roughage and you see some show up in your stool later right. when you have a poo? Like, I don't know. I think that's actually very predictable and very normal. Um, but yeah, I, I like the idea of going, circling back to your provider or an episode of the IBS Freedom Podcast and kind of exploring the idea of like, what is normal? And knowing that progress is not a straight line, that's going to be like the this little wavy, snarly looking line. And that's okay, as long as the general trend over time is heading the right direction, and you're gradually feeling better. But you know, it's like, if you don't change anything, nothing's going to change. Right, right. So if you never add in new foods, you're not going to make the progress you want. And if you don't like, explore some of these things, like you're just going to stagnate and not get better. And that's not what you want. That's not why you're listening to us right now. Um, I want to be mindful of this is such a weird statement. I want to be mindful of your boobs. Because I know CC might be Did calling you see you me soon. Uh, like, uh, earlier, I was like, Oh, they're, they're pretty <laughs> full. She, no, I didn't. She didn't yeah. eat super well the last time I fed her. So mm-hmm, that little bugger. Well, I, I want to be mindful of your boobs as weird as that is. But um, but I had another, like two related red flags that we could talk about together. And then I think I'm good wrapping up from here, yep. if you are. I, I am too. Um, we talked about the oftentimes OCD-ish tendency to research the crap out of everything. And like, be on PubMed and SIBO summits and online groups and YouTube videos and podcasts. And like, if your life is consumed by researching, you can research, you can collect data in two other ways. And similarly, if you're constantly clawing for this sort of data, I think it's very similar and very problematic. Um, you could be looking for data and desperately clawing for data points by doing testing. Yep. So if you're the person who like, you know, is on the forums or online or shopping around and you go to your practitioner and you're like, I was just reading about the oat test. I really think I need an oat test. Will you order it for me? Or like, I was just, you know, contemplating the cosmos and I decided I need a GI map. Will you order that? Like, there's a little bit of both. Again, there's some gray. There are situations where like, the, like you might, the practitioner might not know about a test or they might not have thought of that yet or they might have been on the fence and they wanted to save you the expense initially. And then when you bring it up, they're like, yeah, I, I actually think that would be reasonable. Let's go ahead and do it. Um, I, I think that it's all about the approach and the tone and like the mental health piece of it. I've had instances where a patient approaches me and says, Hey, I would really like this test. Can you order it to me for me? Or do you think it's appropriate? If they're like relatively normal and calm in their approach. And if they have it, the approach of like, I kind of feel like this would help. What do you think? Right. I feel like that's fine. But again, if it's this like clamoring, desperate, um, I'm not getting better yet. And I'm totally freaked out. And I need more data points to tell me that I'm going the right way. Or I need I need to like find the answer, whatever that means. Um, if it's that like desperate kind of kind of thing, or if it's like this test will scratch an itch for a little bit, mm. and then you're going to immediately ask for a new test. Like, okay, we do the oat test this time. Next time, are you going to ask me for a Dutch test? The time after that, are you going to ask me right. for a SIBO test? The time after that, is it going to be a GI map? The time after that, is it going to be you know a whatever test? Like, so I think it's, again, it's like the pattern, it's the tone, it's the approach. 
But I've definitely seen that with patients where they, again, they don't trust themselves. They may or may not trust their practitioners, including me, and they want objective truth in the form of a laboratory assessment. And I'm here to tell you, hot off the heels of posting my first GI map video, I don't know if any test gives you 100% objective truth. Some are worse than others, <clears throat> GI map, but I really don't know if the answers you get back on that piece of paper are as crystal clear as you have been led to believe. So it's very dangerous to put all your eggs in the basket mm -hmm. of testing and spend a boatload of money on testing when it, it just, A, it's going to feed into the OCD cycle, and B, it may or may not give you the answers that you seek. Um, the final one I'll just mention that's related is you might find yourself, again, clamoring and clawing for objective proof by doing body scans mm -hmm. and constantly observing your body and constantly being hyper vigilant about every little thing. Like I've had, I've had people work with me where they're like, well, um, I ate a strawberry and then my nose ran. I must have a histamine issue. No, you don't. <laughs> like, calm down. Like, I'm not saying that histamine issues are not real. We have two episodes on hist histamine and mast cells. But like, if you're observing your body to that degree where it's like, oh, I got a booger. Like, just calm, like, calm down. It, that is not serving you. I can almost guarantee it. Or like one gas bubble or like one weird poop. Again, it's historical data. And it's like the severity of the symptoms. I, I just think that a lot of people would benefit from doing fewer body scans and right. um, observing their symptoms less. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Well, again, I, I think the interesting thing about the testing is... I feel like you can always get sort of a sense too if someone's had like a bazillion tests and then yes. they're requesting more tests and it's like, well, you, you didn't get better off the results of the millions of tests that we just ran. So like, yeah. let's look and see what are the obvious things that you're missing yeah. that's not going to be seen on a test. Um, yeah. And again, sometimes like people are like a lot of people are going to be okay with that. But I think again, like there's a vein of the clients that I work with where it's like, they really want to test and they're always asking like, well, when are we going to mm -hmm. test? And I'm like, well, we just got to wait a little bit trust, and like address issues. some of these things. And, yeah. and again, I think part of it too is like, there's so much marketing around the testing too, which can be problematic. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I think the body scanning thing, I, I think again, like if people skipped over the OCD episodes and any of this stuff is resonating, definitely like circle back to those. And um, I, I titled it a little bit um, sneaky. Uh, the title of the episode is not the OCD episode. It's titled something to the effect of you might have this and not know it. Right. And I'll just spoiler alert, that's the OCD episode. Right. right. And we talk about this more. And then we have a guest episode as well. But yeah, I think circling back to that a bit and just, you know, research, help OCD, like look into it a little bit. Right. Um, you act, it, I, I know I said <laughs> that was the last one, but I just have one more quick note to make. Um, the idea of foregoing testing and getting back to the unsexy basics and like, oh, how's your sleep? How's your stress? Are you moving? How's your overall nutrition? Like, we've been saying that since episode one, I think. Right. Is like, maybe do less testing and less like fancy, sexy stuff, like new supplements and new proprietary whatever, and get back to the basics and really focus on those things. We will say that now we will say it until the cows come home in episode 30 or season 33 of the IBS Freedom Podcast. Um, but here's the final red flag that I want to share with you all. If you hear something like that, and you have any inkling in you that says, well, but that's not me. Like earlier in the episode when I said this thing applies to like 99.5% of you, if you find yourself automatically assuming that you're in the 0.5%, that's a red flag. <laughs> like we all, every human being has I'm special syndrome. It's not a bad thing. I have I'm special syndrome. I'm sure Amy does too. There are certain times where you just think you're so goddamn special. <laughs> However, 
And you are special. At each and every one of you is a special, unique, beautiful snowflake that Elsa would be so proud of. However, if you find yourself like hearing stuff like this and you're like writing off something like sleep or stress or movement, and you're like, ah, no, because you think like, oh, well, she said it's applicable to 99%, but I'm obviously a, a tough case or a really advanced case, or like, I'm so special, I must be in the 0.5% or the 1%. Just just know that that is red flaggy in itself. And like, the, the very strong odds are you are not in that one or 0.5%. Mm. You are actually in the 99%. And you would still benefit from going back to, again, the unsexy, unglamorous basics. And I I think I'll leave it at that. There's more to it, I'm sure. But um, but yeah, like, go back, revisit some of the basics, like just think of it from the perspective, not from how does one treat SIBO? Or how does one treat Candida? Or how does one treat IBS? Look at it from the perspective of what building blocks do I need for a healthy human body? Right. And maybe look at it through that lens. And with that, I will retire my red flag. Ooh, mic drop. <laughs> I'm pretending I'm to, to drop, drop this mic, but it's attached I to I it. I don't want to. I know, and I don't want to drop it. Our new mics are so pretty. By the way, can we just do a shout out to my husband for the oh, yes. super amazing audio? Mixed I mean, Master part of it is. Mike. Yeah, Mixmaster Mike is doing a heck of a job right now. Do you part think he's going to blush when he listens to this? I wonder what he'll say, because he usually does listen to the beginning and the end as he's he's working on stuff. Um, also, I did I did tell him that I would mess with him one of these days, so I might as well do it now, uh, just to annoy my husband. Oh, my God. There we go. Now that was just <laughs> to annoy Mike. Uh, but seriously, the audio for season two has been so good. And I'm honestly... <laughs> like a little bit uh, cringing when I look back at season one episodes and I hear the audio and I'm like, ooh, yeah, that's 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 a little rough. Um, but well, we got the I, word know, out. I think, again, like... Th- th- we did. The purpose is to share the word. Maybe it wasn't uh, perfect, but we're, we are getting there. Well, and I, I feel like it's a testament to the value of what we're saying is that people listen to us despite very subpar audio. Right. So now... Now, maybe we'll we'll be like on the YouTube trending list or something because we have this amazing, sexy audio all of a sudden. So yes, definite shout out. We're experimenting with Riverside. And so maybe the the video quality is better too. Yeah, I think think shout out to both uh, new microphones, Riverside. We're making upgrades for you guys. And also again, Mixmaster Mike has been uh, nerding out on this on this project. And I'm just so grateful that I recruited him for this job. So enjoy the sleek audio guys. Um, Shout out to Mike in the comments below on YouTube that will thoroughly embarrass him. And that will bring me a great amount of joy. So if you could say like, yay, Mike in the comments on YouTube, that would bring me an immense amount of joy. Um, And I'll just I'll laugh my ass off. Um, But I guess we will see you next time on the IBS Freedom Podcast. Uh, I was thinking we should do a, a, a episode or two about root causes next. That's what I'm kind of craving yeah. right now. So uh, we'll see if we change our minds. But that's what I'm thinking right now for next topic. But as always, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for any kind reviews that you leave for us. Uh, and subscribing and liking and commenting on the YouTube videos. You know the drill. We're on social media. I'm at gut.microbiome.queen at Instagram and Amy is Amy Hollenkamp underscore RD on Instagram. So come find us there and we will see you on the next episode. Toodaloo.